Hello there. Uh, this is George for Lawson Literature, and today I'm going to be reviewing the book by George Leonard called Mastery, The Keys to Success and Long-Term Fulfillment. So another self-help book here. And this one is really uh, pivotal for bringing about more success and productivity in your life. Um, George Leonard begins this book by talking about this kind of anti-mastery mindset and how uh, society has been led by this anti-mastery mindset. For example, um, on uh, page 11, um, he says that seduced by the siren song of a consumerist quick-fix society, we sometimes choose a course of action that brings only the illusion of accomplishment or the shadow of satisfaction. Um, I suppose what he's trying to say here is that um, society at large is anti-mastery. So in this age of capitalism, the general public don't want you to be especially good at anything. They want you to conform to their consumerist culture, uh, as Leonard um, says quite poetically here. Um, on page th 33, um, he touches uh, as well on this anti-mastery mindset where he says, the quick fix anti-mastery mentality touches almost everything in our lives. Um, end quote. Society here, he describes, is like an amusement park for the ego, so that it kind of distracts you from looking inside. Uh, it distracts you from developing mastery at anything because it wants you to be a follower, not a creator. Now, for those of you who are confused about what mastery is, um, mastery is a process that can go on for your whole life. It's not just learning a new skill, say, in 20 days. It's spending your whole life committing yourself to a particular skill in order to actually become a master of that skill, to really be so good at it that you're almost quite humble about it, in a way. Um, on page 12, he mentions that all of us who are born without serious genetic defects are born geniuses. Without an iota of formal instruction, we can master the overarching symbolic system of spoken language, and not just one language, but several. End quote. And that is amazing, really, because then you begin to realise that we are actually all capable of mastery. This isn't just some idea for those particular people who are deemed particularly good at things. So you don't have to be particularly good at anything to start a journey of mastery. Because as human beings, we're all given the capabilities to, to, to learn things. And um, we have mastered our own language. We've um, our own mother tongue. For example, mine is English. I, I never learned English from a book. I, I learned it from my mother or my father. Um, but I've mastered that now to the extent where I don't even actually have to think about doing this skill of speaking English. I can just do it on the spot, sort of spontaneously. And that's where you want to get as a master, I think, is you want to get to this point of being spontaneous about everything you do, rather than very kind of rigid. Anyway, um, continuing on, um, he says on page 14, there's really no way around it. Learning any new skill involves relatively br brief spurts of progress each of which is followed by a slight decline to a plateau somewhat higher in most cases than that which preceded it. Why does learning take place in spurts? We have to keep practicing an unfamiliar movement again and again until we get it in the muscle memory. Uh, end quote. And I like this idea of muscle memory, that you actually have to, in order to learn something, you have to repeat it again and again and again. And that's why the process of mastery takes a long time. Uh, on page 17, he says, how do you best move toward mastery? Uh, to put it simply, 
you practice diligently, but you practice primarily for the sake of practice itself. Rather than being frustrated while on the plateau, you learn to appreciate and enjoy it as much as you do the upward surges. End quote. I really like in this quote the bit where he says about you practicing primarily for the sake of practice itself. Um, this idea that you're not just practicing to get a result out of what you're doing. So if you're learning a new instrument or you're learning a new sport, you're not trying to get the results of that, but you're trying to actually enjoy, you are, you are enjoying the process of actually doing that thing as you're doing it. And I really like that idea. Um, then later, he says um, in this uh, chapter called Meet the Dabbler, the Obsessive and the Hacker, uh, he talks about alternative paths uh, and uh, potential psychological characters we will embrace uh, when fighting against mastery. And um, the three of them are described by Leonard here. Um, the first archetype is called the Dabbler. Um, on page 20 he says, the dabbler has a long resume. The dabbler approaches each new sport, career opportunity or relationship with enormous enthusiasm. He or she loves the rituals involved in getting started, the spiffy equipment, the lingo, the shine of newness. When he, f when he makes his first uh, spurt of progress in a new sport, for example, the dabbler is overjoyed. He can't wait for the next lesson. The fall off from his first peak comes as a shock. The plateau that follows is unacceptable, if not incomprehensible. His enthusiasm quickly wanes. His mind fills up with rationalizations. He tells everyone that it just doesn't fulfill his unique needs. Then it's on to something else. In love relationships, the dabbler specialises in honeymoons. To stay on the path of mastery here would mean changing himself. How much easier it is to jump into another bed and start the process all over again. The dabbler might think of himself as an adventurer, a connoisseur of novelty, but he's probably closer to being what Carl Jung calls the puer eternus, the eternal kid. End quote. Uh, and I like this idea of the dabbler being the eternal kid, someone who just can't stop um, looking for new things to do rather than simply sticking out with one thing. Because what happens with the dabbler, I guess, is that they'll, begin, they'll start one thing, uh, like learning guitar. They'll see some guitar, really good guitar player, and think, oh, I wish I could learn guitar. I wish I'd love to be able to learn guitar for myself. Now, most people will be dabblers, you say. Most people will start to learn the guitar, and they might make some progress. They might learn some chords, maybe a D, an A, a G, etc. But past that, they won't actually learn any more, because they'll get to a point where they realise, oh, hang on a minute, now it's getting harder. It's getting too hard for me now. Um, and also, now I realise I've got lots of time I need to practice in order to get better with n no seeming progress. This is what George Lennon means by the plateau, is just the long period of time where you're not actually doing anything uh, in terms of results, but you're doing a lot in terms of practice. And the dabblers hate this, and that's why the dabblers always quit and then move on to the next thing. I, that's why I find it really funny how he says that the dabbler has a long resume, as though like his CV is full of different things um, that he's tried but never really got very far in doing. Uh, the next archetype George Leonard has is the obsessive. Uh, the obsessive, he says on page 21, is a bottom line type of person, not one to, sec to settle for second best. The obsessive starts out by making robust progress. His first spurt is just what he expected, but he inevitably regresses and finds himself on a plateau. He simply won't accept it. 
He refuses to accept his bosses and colleagues' counsel of moderation. He works all night at the office. He's tempted to take shortcuts for the sake of quick results. Somehow, in whatever he is doing, the obsessive manages for a while to keep making brief spurts of upward, upward progress, followed by sharp declines. A jagged ride toward a sure fall. When the fall occurs, the obsessive is likely to get hurt. And so are friends, colleagues, stockholders and lovers. End quote. Um, that's a very accurate description, I think, of someone who is probably a bit more advanced than the dabbler, in that when a dabbler um, gets to the point of, of the plateau and, he, and they think it's too hard to carry on, they just stop, whereas the obsessive keeps going obsessively again and again and again, constantly going, but they don't, but they're not patient. That's the thing about, that's what separates the obsessive from any higher, more advanced level, is that the obsessive is, has no patience, and so they want results right now. And so they, and if they don't get results, they'll keep on trying harder and harder, and they will destroy any other parts of their life, their relationships, just so they can get, you can get the time to be better at this thing. And of course, that, that strategy never works. The obsessive strategy never works, you see. It just ends in um, horror <laughs> for, for not only the obsessive, but the people who are uh, related to the obsessive, the friends, lovers, family, etc. Um, and this final and third archetype George Leonard mentions is really interesting. It's, it's called the hacker. Um, on page 23, Leonard says that the hacker has a different attitude. After sort of getting the hang of a thing, he or she is willing to stay on the plateau indefinitely. He doesn't mind skipping stages essential to the development of mastery if he can just go out and hang around with fellow hackers. The hacker looks at marriage or living together not as an opportunity for learning and development, but as a comfortable refuge from the uncertainties of the outside world. But in today's world, two partners are rarely willing to live indefinitely on an unchanging plateau. When your tennis partner starts improving his or her game, and you don't, the game eventually breaks up. The same thing applies to relationships. End quote. Uh, and this uh, this hacker archetype is probably typical of anyone who is good at something, really good at something, in fact, who's been doing it a long time, but doesn't want to advance to any harder stage or can't be bothered to advance any further. So they actually love the plateau so much that they, they, they just stay on it. They don't make any improvement at all. Um, so they kind of stay at one particular level. Um, and this, again, is actually also an anti-mastery mindset because a master, as opposed to a hacker, is always improving, always getting better and better, whereas the hacker is kind of just content with staying at the same level. And as we can see in the case of relationships, this hacker mindset doesn't work because, say, if you're in a relationship with someone, the other person might happen to grow more as a person and leave you behind. And that would break up the relationship. So you've got to be constantly, say in any relationship, you've got to be constantly learning and developing from each other. Um, on page 25, um, he says that um, these characters then have proven useful in helping us see why we're not on the path of mastery. But the real point is to get on that path and start moving. Um, so, though we've been discussing these anti-mastery mindsets just here, um, it's important, he says, that we actually start to learn how to get on the path of, the path of mastery. So, let's move on to the next section. In part two, uh, George Leonard talks about the five mastery keys. Now, um, these keys are the essential elements you'll need in order to gain mastery at anything you want to do in life. 
So the first key is instruction. Um, now here, when you're looking for instruction for learning anything new, uh, you might want to look to the internet. Um, you might want to learn look to books, maybe uh, courses, and um, if possible, human instructors. Um, and this one, Leonard argues that human instructors are, of course, the best way um, to learn and. Possibly they are, but I, I also think that um, they're very expensive. And if you want to have a sort of cheaper, more inexpensive way of learning something new, it's it's good to be able to go to internet resources and things like that, books, etc. Um, so uh, what I'd say on that is that actually, if you look properly, you will be able to find... Um, Good and in, good instructions on how to do things. It's all out there. Um, on page fifty-five, Leonard talks about in, instruction. He says, "If you intend to, to take the journey of mastery, the best thing you can do is to arrange for first-rate instruction. Um, to see the teacher clearly, look at the students. They are his work of art." Focus your attention on the students, even more on the interaction. So, end quote. What he's saying here is that if you're looking for a human instructor, that is, you want to look at the students because the students are the teacher's work of art. The students are developed through their interaction with um the teacher and Leonard goes on to explain this concept of interaction on page 68 he says learning eventually involves interaction between the learner and the learning environment and its effectiveness relates to the frequency quality variety and intensity of the interaction end quote so um in order to learn something new there needs to be a, a, there, needs, there needs to be a very wide uh, range of interaction with the, with the learning environment. Um, it, it needs to have uh, it needs to be a quality interaction. It needs to be it needs to have variety, intensity, and a, and frequency as well. So it needs to have it needs to be a highly energetic um, interaction between the teacher and the student in order to achieve any success here. On page 71, um, Leonard says, On the path to mastery, learning never ends. In the words of the great Japanese swordmaster, Yamaoka Teshu, um, Do not think that this is all there is. More and more wonderful teachings exist. The sword is unfathomable. End quote. So here... Um, I like this quote from the Swordmaster, um, in uh, particularly the word unfathomable, in that actually there is no end to learning. So as as for the instruction you get in mastery, the instruction can never is is sort of never ending really. There is no I've completed the instruction. You can't complete the instruction for anything because there will always be more to learn. Uh, in key two. Um, Leonard s states that practice is another element of mastery. So, um, on page 74 he says, For one who is on the master's journey, the word is best conceived of as a noun, not as something you do, but as something you have, something you are. In this sense, the word is akin to the Chinese words tal and the Japanese word Do, both of which mean literally road or path. Practice is the path upon which you travel. Just that. So I like this idea that practice isn't just something you do. It's not just something you're doing. It's it's it, it's it's actually a, a noun. It's actually a thing in itself. It's a road. The practice of guitar, for example, is a road to learning guitar. Um, it's it's not just something you do, but something, but a way that you are. You are your practice, 
And the master actually understands this. The master will understand that they are the practice. They are, they are embodying the practice they, they, they are involved in. Um, on page 79, uh, Leonard says that to practice regularly, even when you seem to be getting nowhere, might at first seem onerous. But the day eventually comes when practicing becomes a treasured part of your life. You settle into it, as if into your favourite easy chair, unaware of time and the turbulence of the world. It will still be there for you tomorrow. It will never go away. How long will it take me to master Aikido? A, a prospective student asks. How long do you expect to live? Is the only respectable response. Ultimately, practice is the path of mastery. End quote. And I like this. I, I love that so much that, that one where he says, how long do you expect to live? Um, because practice really is here a lifelong process. It takes people. This is why people dedicate their lives to to particular crafts, particular skills, because it, that's how long it can take to learn anything. There is actually sort of no end. To, to, to learning in a way. And this is what Leonard is trying to say here. Um, and even though practice at first may seem onerous or may seem boring, the idea that you have to practice the same thing every day, eventually it actually becomes a very treasured part of your life. You, you enjoy the practice as though settling into your favourite easy chair in a way. Um, and this leads on to key three, which is surrender. On page 81, uh, Lena says, The courage of a master is measured by his or her willingness to surrender. This means surrendering to your teacher and to the demands of your discipline. It also means surrendering your own hard-worn proficiency from time to time in order to reach a higher or different level of proficiency. Um, and End quote. And uh, what he's trying to say here is that you need to surrender to your practice in order to achieve actually a higher level of practice. Um, and if you don't, you may end up like the hacker and end up just on sort of one level, really. So you want to be able to surrender your existing skills for better skills, in this sense. For example, on page 84, he mentions uh, the parable or story of the cup and the quart. He says, The parable of the cup and the quart applies here. There's a quart of milk on the table, within your reach, but you're holding a cup of milk in your hand, and you're afraid to let go of the cup in order to get the quart. And that's what he means by surrendering. That's what he means by letting go of the smaller ability, abilities you have in order to grow and get the bigger abilities. So uh, key four, let's move on. Key four is intentionality. Now here he, he mentions a couple of people. First, he mentions golfer Jack Nicklaus. Uh, on page 89, he says, Golfer Jack Nicklaus, let it be known that he never hit a shot without first clearly visualizing the ball's perfect flight and its triumphant destination. End quote. And I love this because it has this idea of vision, that you need vision for mastery. Uh, you need to image what it's going to be like when, when you're uh, really good at something. And this, this actually very much leads on to the idea of law of attraction, um, that what you think about will manifest itself in your life. If you think positively about the future, the future is going to manifest itself in your reality eventually. Um, and on page 96, he mentions Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, someone you may know. He says, All I know, said Arnold Schwarzenegger, is that the first step is to create the vision. Because when you see the vision there, the beautiful vision, that creates the want power. For example, my wanting to be Mr. Universe came about because I saw myself so clearly being up there on stage and winning. 
Intentionality fuels the master's journey. Every master is a master of vision. End quote. And that ends uh, the fourth key, which is intentionality. Finally, key five, um, Leonard says, is the edge. Um, on page 97, um, he says, These masters are precisely the ones who are likely to challenge previous limits, to take risks for the sake of higher performance. Now, this, this idea of pushing the boundaries of your field reminds me of the quote by T.S. Eliot. He said, Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. End quote. And um, it, it clearly illustrates that actually any field you go into, whether it be drawing, guitar, um, writing, uh, any sport, football, etc., anything you want to do in your life, it act- the field is actually endless. Like there's always new possibilities to discover in a field. There's always new things to do. So there's never an end to what you can achieve in your practice. Of mastery. In part three of mastery, uh, George Leonard summarizes by giving us um, all the a list of all the tools that you're going to need for your journey. Um, so uh, here is the mastery toolkit that Leonard gives. Um, the first part in the toolkit is the five master keys, which we just mentioned before. So Key one, instruction. Key two, practice. Key three, surrender. Key four, intentionality. And key five, the edge. Then there are other parts to the toolbox. So dealing with change and homeostasis. So be aware of the way homeostasis, um, which is resistance to change, works. Be willing to negotiate with your resistance to change. Uh, Develop a support system. Follow a regular practice. uh, Dedicate yourself to lifelong learning. Um, And then the next part is getting energy for mastery. So um, here you need to maintain physical fitness. uh, Acknowledge the negative and accentuate the positive. Try telling the truth. Honour, but don't indulge your own dark side. Set your priorities, make commitments, take action, and get on the path of mastery and stay on it. Then the final section is uh, pitfalls along the path. These include conflicting way of life, obsessive goal orientation, poor instruction, lack of competitiveness, over-competitiveness, laziness, injuries, drugs, prizes and medals, vanity, dead seriousness, inconsistency, and perfectionism. And that's the end of the toolkit there. So hopefully you can maybe write these down or memorize these. This will be useful on your mastery journey. And now sort of summarizing um, uh, the book with some some of my favorite quotes uh, on a page, this first one is on page 36, uh, where he talks about society and its kind of anti mastery mindset. He says, There's perhaps no more dangerous time for any society than its moment of greatest triumph. It would be truly foolish to let the decline of communism blind us to the long term contradictions in a free market economy, unrestrained by considerations of the environment and social justice, and driven by heedless consumerism, instant gratification, and the quick fix. Our dedication to growth at all costs puts us on a collision course with the environment. Our dedication to the illusion of endless climaxes puts us on a collision course with the human psyche. End quote. And that's actually hauntingly relevant today, this idea that you can get results quick, that everything all around you in marketing, advertising, is all, um, they're all advertising quick results for things. Get this, just, just, you know, buy this product and you'll, you'll become healthy or this will improve or your finances will improve, etc. 
Whereas in reality, anything you want to be good at in life, you have to work very hard towards. It involves a work ethic. It involves practice. It involves mastery. Um, page 44, um, however, has uh, Leonard describing um, that, there, that though there is all this kind of entry mastery mindset, there is also some hope. He says here that, quote, despite our society's urgent and effective war against mastery, there are still millions of people who, while achieving great things in their work, are dedicated to the process as well as the product. People who love the plateau. Life for these people is especially vivid and satisfying. It's my truest happiness, a writer friend told me. It's the time when all the crap goes away. As soon as I walk into my study, I start getting cues of pleasure. My books on the shelves, the particular odour of the room. These cues begin to tie in to what I've written and what I'm going to write. Even if I've stayed up all night, my fatty disappears. Just like that. There's a whole range of pleasure waiting for me, from making one sentence work to getting a new insight. End quote. And that's a very haunting description of what it's like to be a master on this journey. Um, he says that all the crap goes away, all the, all the distractions of life goes away, and then you can, you can just focus on one thing. Um, in this case, it's writing. He's just focusing on writing. He's getting into his study. He's getting the cues of pleasure, like the odour of the books, even just, just the very simple things. He's loving the simple pleasures of his practice. And that's what gets him into the sort of mood, gets him into the easy chair of practice, in a way. Um, and uh, to describe the sort of love for his practice, uh, Olympic gymnast Peter Vidmar um, says, uh, this is what Leonard quotes here, um, when you discover your own desire, you're not going to wait for other people to find solutions to your problems. You're going to find your own. I set goals for myself, but underlying all the goals and the work was the fact that I enjoyed it. End quote. And this idea of enjoyment you have to enjoy what you're doing in order to be good at it. So, and to enjoy what you're doing, you're not just focused on the product or the results of doing that thing, but you're just you're just focused on thriving in what you're doing. You're focused on enjoying all the very simple pleasures of your practice. And that's what Peter Vidmar is trying to say here. And um, I just want to end on this last quote by George Leonard. Um, which always makes me smile. He says on page 47, Mastery's true face is relaxed and serene, sometimes faintly smiling. And I love this quote because he's giving an, us an idea of the image of what mastery might look like on a person. If you, if you see a master, if you see a master who's really good at something, they'll have a face which is relaxed, it's serene, faintly smiling. It's as though they're fully concentrating on the goal at hand, yet also completely relaxed, patient and flexible about what they're doing. And I suppose to end this talk about um, George Leonard's book on mastery, um, I suppose the key concept I've got um, from this book is this concept of patience and this idea that anything you do take requires patience, it requires time, it requ requires effort and it requires frustration but also also enjoyment. If you want to be good at anything you have to you have to love what you're doing and loving what you're doing is the only way to generate any any patience. If you're just focused on the result of what of, of something. If you're focused on the result of any practice, then you're never going to be very good at the practice because you're so focused on the result. However, if you're focused on the practice and simply enjoying what you're doing, then you're bound to become so much more proficient at what you're doing and in turn make the most of it. 
that's what mastery is about. It's actually making the most of your work. So, thank you for listening, and be sure to uh, tune in again for the next episode of Lawson Literature.